Mr. Avinash Trivedi, uh, panelists, again, Puneet is the moderator, Mr. Pavan Desai, Colonel Deepak, Major Paul Devasi, Mr. Sambaji Naik, a warm good morning. I would also like to welcome the members of FACI and especially a warm welcome to the members of OSAC International and ACES International. We at FACI during this uh, COVID period have conducted over uh, 120 webinars and uh, we, we had uh, around 28,000 participants in these webinars. A lot of topics have been covered and uh, the series of security topics uh, uh, has been uh, designed by our security team and today is uh, one of the security seminar which we are conducting. We are, we, this is only a beginning and uh, I would like to wish the security team all the very best and I would request the participants uh, to join us in all our webinars and also join FSAI and help us grow. Just for the information of uh, non-members of FSAI, FSCI is a non-profit organization established in 2002 representing the fire protection, life safety, security, building automation, loss prevention, risk management domain. FSCI's basic objective is to spread the awareness of life safety and security and we have 24 chapters across India and as you know we have covered all the cities of uh, India. And we have uh, currently around 7,000 members, including end users, global corporates, Indian OEMs, architects, consultants, system integrators. We also have student chapters across all these chapters. Our vision is Surakshit Bharat, and our mission is to establish life safety and security as an important human obligation in the economic development of the country. We at FSA are keen to make, it, make India one of the safest nation in the world. There are a lot of activities uh, uh, which we do conduct, but I would uh, uh, now request uh, Mr. Pankaj Darkar, our presidential member, to uh, please uh, uh, elaborate on the activities which are of interest. Uh, over to you, Mr. Darkar. Thanks, uh, Suresh. and. Uh... Romil, um, for setting the tone for today. I think I'm delighted to see uh, Tiwari ji with uh, Puneet ji, Avinash ji in action uh, with a, such a, for such an important topic where Lieutenant Colonel Pavan, Deepak ji, uh, Major Paul, Sambaji, uh, Purvesh, very eminent personalities. It is very delight to see such a gathering of such a speakers and panelists uh, with such an important subject uh, uh, friend, security risk analysis is extremely important aspect of critical infrastructures and this does give an insight to consultants like us to design a uh, security framework for facilities, be, it, be it hospitality, hospitals, data centers, critical infrastructures uh, like petrochemicals, uh, pharmaceutical industry. A good Security design for facility will ensure the threat mitigated thoroughly and we should ensure that a security risk analysis is done as a practice uh, to help uh, security experts uh, or designers who design the security framework. I think these are two uh, independent important subjects uh, to do a mitigation and to a, do a detailed engineering part of it and which I, I'm sure the panelists today will emphasize. Uh, friends, as, as many of you would be aware that uh, FSAI has, is coming up uh, or rather has launched uh, FSAI Suraksha Index, uh, which uh, I am chairing with uh, many eminent personalities uh, on board. And this is going to be the first global system of its kind where fire and security of a built environment will be analyzed like a green building certification where a rating scale is being developed and Tiwari ji, Puneet ji and entire security team is helping me on this endeavor. Uh, I would like, sir, that uh, 
this aspect of uh, mitigation and uh, analysis, uh, which you will be uh, discussing today, is given due importance and credits in our FSI index, so that there is a good awareness created uh, across the country, across the segment, be it commercial building, be it uh, hospital, hotel, that this is an important task. And if that's done, uh, we give additional credit in our rating system so that there is a huge awareness created slowly and uh, gradually. Uh, of course, uh, with that, uh, you must have seen this uh, small clipping video. Uh, I've been getting excellent support across the country for uh, a task which president gave me for helping people on COVID. Uh, please come forward and help FSA on this. We are taking donations right from 500 onwards. Uh, the idea is to really protect our firemen who are doing sanitation work, disinfection work, and also uh, reaching to the slums and small areas where normally fire people uh, are finding it difficult to do sanitation. So uh, thanks again, uh, Suresh ji, uh, for giving this two important task to me and excellent support we have been getting with security team. Uh, we really want to do on security side of uh, FSAI and thank you Tiwari ji for Tiwari ji and Puni ji for heading us and taking us to a new height. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your kind words and uh, telling about the COVID task force. I also request everyone, the participants, to have to be a part of our COVID task force. Now, to start the panel discussion, let me introduce the moderator today, Mr. Puneet Garkil. Mr. Puneet Garkil is a partner with the Forensic Services Practice in PwC, Mumbai, where he leads the Global Intelligence and Strategic Threat Advisory Services. Mr. Puneet is a partner with Forensic Services Practice and leads the Corporate Intelligence and Strategic Threat Practices in India. He has over 22 plus years of exhaustive experience encompassing large multinational complex investigations, corporate intelligence, fraud risk assessments, security design and management, outsourcing risk and multidimensional facets of managing business crisis and physical security risks. He specializes in background check engagements, FRM reviews, strategic business intelligence, commercial due diligence and physical security. Prior to joining PwC in 2014, Mr. Puneet headed the fraud risk practice for his earlier organization. He also serves as vice chairman FSAI security and IoT function. So over to Mr. Puneet to introduce the panelists today and to start the discussion. Over to you, sir. Thanks. Uh, thanks a ton, Romil. And thank you, uh, Suresh uh, Pankaji, uh, for the kind words. But we'll try our level best to be where we intend to be in the shortest possible time. Uh, well, today is an interesting uh, panel. And I must say we have probably the largest experience from a physical security system design and what physical security primarily means uh, sitting here with us today. And uh, thank you very much for all of you all who kind of have taken time out uh, to come here. Uh, before I really delve into how the panel will work and what is this, what is it that we will really want to cover today, uh, just to uh, quickly take you through all the panelists that we have today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, very happy to introduce uh, Lieutenant Order uh, Pavan Desai. Uh, known him for a long, long time, and must say, learned a lot from him uh, in to wherever I am today. Uh, so to introduce Pavan, Pavan is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Midcat Advisory Services. It's one of the leading uh, security, cybersecurity, intelligence and business resiliency uh, consulting firms. Uh, Pavan has almost uh, two and a half decades of experience uh, leading global organizations and working across uh, spans of Asia and Africa. He has been a distinguished naval officer uh, and has uh, led information security and business continuity practice as one of the in one of the, India's leading uh, companies 
uh, another company which I used to work earlier with uh, before he co-founded with Gap. Uh, he was also selected by the U.S. State Department uh, for International Security Program organized by the State Department in April 2014 and was also uh, shortlisted as Consultant of the Year by the BCI UK in 2012. He obviously, uh, with his profile, speaks in leading global conferences, including Duty of Care, OSAC, ACES, etc., and also is a very key visiting faculty in uh, leading educational institutes like uh, NMIMS and SCIT. Uh, Pawan also did serve as the secretary of ACES Mumbai chapter in the year 2017-18, and is one of the leading security professionals uh, in, in the world today, primarily, if I can say that. So thank you very much, Pavan, for being uh, and you know sharing uh, your thoughts here and also spending your time with us. Thank you so much for that. Uh, our next uh, panelist is Colonel Deepak Kajla, and again a veteran uh, that I have known and has almost uh, 22 years uh, of uh, experience in the army and eight years in the security consulting space. Uh, depth of experience that he has and he works as an independent security consultant. Uh, Deepak has worked on a security technology design uh, consultant and the Mahindra Special Services Group from the year 2010 to 15, and then he was in control risk for the next two years. Uh, both these firms are primarily leading security consulting firms, uh, and they obviously follow the best practices. Uh, from 18 to 2010, then uh, Deepak worked on multiple security uh, technology projects of Brookfield in India and they had campuses in Gurgaon, Noida, Kolkata and, uh, and all. So you will, you will see that there's a depth of experience coming in from the army, leading into consulting and then working for large infrastructure companies. He has personally, I think, done over um, more than 50 plus projects spread across India, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Uh, he is Really, if I may say, the studios of all the consultants that I have seen, uh, sorry, sir, taking the liberty of saying that. Uh, and he has, he's a keen writer and been contributing with a number of articles in different platforms. Right. And I would uh, welcome you to the, uh, to the panel as well. So thank you for being here. Uh, with us, then we have, uh, uh, you know, another key individual, Mr. Sandeep. Uh, uh, sorry, I think Sandeep is. Uh, not uh, joining us today, so I will move on to Mr. Paul uh, Devasi. So Major Paul uh, uh, is actually is the AVP of Safety and Security with OYO India, and you would understand why he's here on the panel today because he comes in from the armed forces, worked with one of the largest logistics companies in the world, and now is into the hospitality industry. So he's on the other side of the fence where he's seen both sides of the field, right? And that gives him the experience of almost 25 years plus of having different uh, domains between hospitality, e-commerce, chemical and manufacturing, etc. cetera. Uh, must uh, definitely allude to the point that while in the army, he was a gallantry awardee while in Kashmir, uh, and he has given lectures in Orlando, Mokau, and numerous other locations, all the you can say the exotic ones can be added out there. Uh, Paul says, sorry again for <laughs> pulling you on this. Uh, he has published articles in professional journals and has contributed to books published in uh, US. Uh, he's also held influential positions in Amazon, Henkel, Standard Chartered Bank, Fidelity, and Corporation Bank. So this actually gives you why he is here today to kind of share with us his experience on either side of the defense. He presently works with OYO as the Assistant Vice President, Safety and Security for India. Uh, he believes in volunteering and facilitating in growth in the next area of risk professionals. And he has also represented ACSG uh, in India. Uh, presently as Vice, uh, Regional Vice uh, President for South Asia in the ACES, uh, the world's largest forum of security professionals. And he has kindly also alluded to uh, you know, help FSAI in whichever way and form he can. Um, so thank you, sir, for that. Uh, we are then followed by our uh, fourth eminent panelist, uh, Mr. Shambhaji Nayak, uh, who is the general manager and head uh, data center security at Yota Infrastructure Solutions. We all know how critical technology has become today. And uh, 
with data centers playing a very, very important role, right? Nobody thought before COVID that life could be different. Uh, people who are on the, on the fly every day, traveling three to four days a week are grounded. And as uh, Dharkar sir before the panel in, uh, was indicating that, you know, uh, it's almost 12, 14 hours sitting in front of laptops, mobile phones, and iPads. Uh, you can really understand uh, the, the load our data center operations are taking today. Uh, as a competent and dedicated professional with our, around 18 years of experience in security ops uh, and uh, planning at aviation security, cruise liners, BPO, hospitals, uh, five-star hotels, and data center. Uh, he has also uh, done the lead auditor course for uh, OHASS 18001, certified uh, pro protection professional, which is CSP, and an MBA in fire and safety from MIT. Uh, currently, he is associated with Yota Infrastructure Solutions as uh, GM uh, DSAT Security uh, and Safety. Uh, he obviously specializes across different domains, uh, which is of risk assessment, including mit mitigation plans, electronic security, uh, security design and implementation, crisis management, and he can go on and on with different uh, uh, areas that he has uh, worked upon. So welcome, sir. Uh, I believe we were supposed to be joined by Purvesh, but in case he does join in, uh, there were some last minute pickups. Uh, I will introduce him at a later point of time. So uh, taking it on from there, uh, welcome to all the panelists and thank you for uh, being here today. Uh, so if, uh, can I, uh, can I, Romil, move ahead and start the panel with your- Yes, sir. Sir, most welcome for it, please. Perfect, thank you so much. So taking the panel on from here, as you all know, the, the, the subject that we have today is from the safety and the security domain, which is primarily from threat analysis to security system design, understanding the framework in the changing business environment. Now, uh, why this topic, right? And everybody today talks about safety and security, but uh, let's be candid here. How many of us really, really delve into the details of understanding the smaller nuances of what a security and a system design primarily means, right? We all talk about security and we'll say, oh, well, we put in some cameras, so we have the security design in place. Somebody will say, well, I have, you know, I have put a biometric, so I'm safe. And we all lived into this fallacy that it cannot happen to me. And COVID-19 happening, has actually told you it doesn't really matter who you are, what stature you are in the world, uh, whether you're an MNC, whether you're a small time Indian firm, it doesn't really matter, right? The impact has been the same across uh, a lot of places. And this is exactly what, in my experience, and I'm sure with the panelists here, they will all uh, delve into the point to say that we never focused on a end-to-end model right it was always doing things piecemeal with the view that it can't happen to me and trying to cut corners or if i may say cut budgets or do whatever to say how do i really prove a point and still achieve uh, what i want to achieve well that's not true and my experience per se has been uh, different in this uh, this domain i would obviously want to hear from the eminent panelists that we have here as to what they think and the idea primarily for uh, this, this discussion today is to say, why don't we really go back to the grassroots level? Why don't we go back to a, the ABC concepts of what a security design primarily means? And that's what we will be uh, talking today. What we intend to cover today is the different parameters right from start from A to Z as to how uh, we should look at a security design in this challenging business environment. And we would also uh, would like to share with the audience who, who've taken time out on a Saturday and come here, a couple of case studies, right? In terms of really focusing and telling you that, okay, this is a live case study, this is how it was done, and these are the benefits that were achieved. This primarily helps us to really understand the smaller nuances, which we might uh, not be able to really uh, appreciate in the in the normal course when we are really uh, doing stuff. So right from doing the assessments to looking at the technology aspects and to looking at, at the case studies is what we plan to cover in the next 60 to 75 minutes. Uh, we would be very happy to take questions uh, uh, from the people who are attending. Uh, it'd be good to kind of have a dialogue. So please do type in your questions and I'm sure Romer will be able to 
uh, aggregated and shared with all of us uh, in the course. And I'm sure we'll open the lines after uh, the panelists have spoken about it in terms of how do we really want to take this forward. So without too much ado, uh, I think I will, I will get straight into the topic, straight into the point, and I will start off with you, Pawan. The idea primarily being uh, that, you know, we always talk about threat vulnerability risk assessment is important in defining how a security strategy for any organization, asset, greenfield, brownfield, might want to take, right? Now, the idea is when you want to really talk about a threat vulnerability assessment, do you, what are the nuances that you really go back to look at? So I would actually want to go take, you know, take you a step back and you know, explain to us with your experience as to how a TVRA primarily would get implemented. What would you do? How would you conduct such a TVRA? And what, if there is, is there a standard that one would follow, right? So what, what is it that you think we should be doing with, a, with the depth of experience that you have and being this in, and doing this in the industry for the last uh, 15 years? Where, where do you want to kind of start off and where do you want to end? I think uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Thanks FSAI for this opportunity. I think uh, I'm very happy. Uh, I think uh, for two uh, reasons. Uh, one is uh, the, for a change. We are not doing anything related to COVID. It's something different, uh, which we are talking about after a long, long time. I think I've heard that. Uh, secondly, I think very surprisingly, people are talking about security design risk assessment. I think for the very first time in India. This must be a very historic moment uh, uh, for everyone, all participants, as well as panelists. So I think uh, this is this has never been spoken. I have, I have, I have spoken about this uh, across the globe, but in India, we have never spoken about this topic. Uh, 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 I may be wrong, but uh, uh, to my best of the knowledge, we have never spoken about this subject. So it's a great start. I think it's a great start. I think must thank FSCI for, for this uh, selecting this topic. Uh, I will just take a uh, one step back on, on uh, from uh, risk assessment to I think uh, I'll I'll be because I think uh, Colonel Kajla will be talking about each step in detail. I will like to even uh, give the perspective of this whole industry of security design and uh, risk analysis. I, I see there are three C's uh, in the whole uh, uh, I think uh, whole uh, domain. One is a context, second is the conflict, and third is a competency. I think I'll take uh, each aspect uh, very, very quickly. Uh, uh, what I mean by that. One is the context aspect of that. Uh, in my uh, 15, 60 years of uh, civil uh, uh, consulting space experience, context, uh, when we talk about threat vulnerability risk assessment is all about contextualizing the requirement. And that doesn't happen. We always start with kitna camera lagana hai. Uh, yeah, access control door mein controller ka itna hona chahiye, budget kya hai? We start with budget. So we start handling the, uh, the tiger or, or a lion from the tail, not from the other side of it. And we have no idea on what we are talking about. And, and when I say we, uh, I'll include all of us, all consultants. We, uh, I think, sorry for next five, 10 minutes. Most of the consultants or vendors are not going to like me what I'm mm -hmm. going to say, but yes, it is very important to put that on table. Uh, we, how, how many of us even know the difference between the security survey or a risk assessment or a SRA and TVRA? These are very two different aspects. TVRA has nothing to do with what you have put in place. TVRA is all about contextualizing what security do you really need? Are you a bank? Are you a bank in a Nexel infested area? Are you a bank in a Bandra or a bank branch in Bandra? The context is very, very important and which most of the consultant as well as end users do not give any uh, weightage to. So very, very important to first segregate that. What do we mean by a TVRA? TVRA is all about threat vulnerability risk assessment. What are the threats? What are the vulnerabilities? And based on your context of your organization, your risk appetite, your culture, what kind of risk are you willing to accept and not willing to accept? And what you want to mitigate? So I'll give one story about, uh, I always like to say, there is a Tata way of doing uh, security and there is a Reliance way of doing security. Now, these are these are terminologies which I'm using, not that Tata uses this or Reliance. It is the way you look at security. Tata, in, in their code of conduct, says that we will trust everybody and anybody unless proven otherwise. Great philosophy. It is there in their code of conduct. 
that means if you see their security they will never have cameras in their uh, work areas they will only have cameras at entry exit uh, at the gates uh, so the whole context of security is very very different the controls are very very different when you come to reliance way of security they says we are going to monitor you irrespective of what levels you are we will have cameras in uh, conference rooms we will have cameras in uh, lift lobbies we believe that you are not going to do anything wrong so if you do not do anything wrong you have nothing to fear about on that thing so it doesn't matter where we put cameras on now there is nothing wrong with both the concept both are great concept to have but when we design do we really know this shows the culture of an organization where we comes from so very very important to understand the context of an organization and then the security system design comes at a later four fifth sixth stage of it but we start from other way around so that was the, my first point of contextualizing the whole thing which we do it wrong second i say the conflict conflict says my 80% of the consulting assignments which are maybe i may be wrong in numbers uh, on the i may be erring on the wrong side it may be more but 80% of the design projects are driven by vendors it is driven by specification kya hona chahiye and then we will put context context is i don't think so it is even uh, considered in, in when we do the security designing of that thing so where is the independence so it is like a internal audit function reporting to cfo it is not the right way to do it the consult ha consultant has to be a independent and it should not have a back end relationship with the vendors which is there so because the care of a vendor is very very different when i say iska security design kar lega wo to vendor kar lega vendor cannot do security design it's not about their Uh, qualification please uh, uh, please do not take me wrong on qualification why it cannot be done because care of any vendor is to sell more cameras that is not wrong he is doing correct his livelihood depends on that how can a vendor give you a security design which is good for you it cannot happen any kind of independence or any kind of good faith will not work in this because the care is are different so if there is a in independence which is missing you cannot get good pvra or a security design in place so that is uh, the second fallacy of conflict which which is very very important and third up is about the competency i think competency again a very thing i think lot of my friends a uh, lot of mep consultants say security design mein kya camera hi to lagana hota hai yeah i think we are very good when we have cardiac arrest we can go to a dentist i think that's the thing what we are talking about we can go to a dentist or a physician if you have cardiac arrest why should we not do it it's the same thing what we are talking about so it's a specialized field unless that importance is given to that specialized field we are not going to get the value out of the whole thing so respect specialization respect independence and respect context i think that's the thing i would like uh, to even uh, start this whole uh, discussion punit i think i'll rest my point at this uh, i think i'll uh, maybe uh, next uh, absolutely and i think you hit the nail on the head but yeah we we'll, we we'll, we'll take it as it comes so perfect uh, thanks for that one and I'll, i'll therefore then move now i'll probably change the sequence and probably move now to uh, kajla sir kajla sir he did alluded on the three c's uh, how would you want to take this at tvra forward so can you can you actually walk us through the four steps that we generally follow in a tvra or the five steps that we generally follow and what would be the correct sequence to do this with the attributes of each so that what pawan has uh, kind of said can dwell in further yeah so uh, you know we all uh, listen to pawan you know and pawan uh, i think you spoke from the heart Uh, and uh, it was such a happy day for me as well you know having done um, security design for the last 10 years and it is finally coming to the forefront and being recognized as a specialized uh, you know skill so arsha can you just uh, share the slide so that we can you know understand the process just just a minute Put it in slide more. Uh, the view more. The first slide. 
the first one, not this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see the first. So so I will. Uh, so there are various. Uh, you can number these steps, but you know I've I've taken nine steps, and uh, starting with the first step, which is risk assessment. So this is what uh, Pawan spoke about the context. So it is through risk assessment that you sort of list what are the assets of those assets, what all is critical, and what are the threats that you face. And accordingly, you know, you, you have the uh, deductions of as to what is the context, what is the risk, and, and what is the sort of level of security that you want to give to the establishment. Now, based on the risk assessment, the second step is defining the operational requirements. Now, again, Pawan gave an example. So in one case, the operation requirements is to cover all uh, areas, you know? And in the second case, the operation requirements of CST was only to cover the common areas. So that is an example of defining the operation requirements for video surveillance. Similarly, you could define for, let's say, the perimeter fence. I mean, uh, do, do you want it impenetrable or do you want just a fence? I mean, do you want a, a warning to be made available in case anyone tries to cross the fence? So that is in terms of defining your operation requirement for fences, or if it comes to access control, I mean, is a manual access control okay? Or do you want to know who came in, when, who went out, when? Or do you also want to know as to who is where in the office? So all that comes to uh, in the step of defining what your operation requirements are. So now once you define what your operation requirements are, then you can come to the preliminary design. In preliminary design, you need to deploy the edge devices on the drawings. So edge devices are the cameras, the scanners, the barriers, uh, the perimeter intrusion detection system. So these are all the edge devices. So once you have the edge devices deployed, then all the relevant stakeholders have a look. The client, the architects, you know, the MEP consultants, the IT consultants, all other you know, consultants, they have a look. So once the preliminary design is approved, then we move on to the tender package. Now the tender package, apart from the drawings, consists of the makes, the specifications. And here, the second point of power one becomes important. Are your specs non-proprietary? I mean, in the industry today, uh, it's, uh, it's become a malice. The, the specs being proprietary is such a, a, a big problem, you know. And, and like Pawan said, we need to, I mean, the clients need to be aware. The clients need to be aware. They need to ask this question. They need to take a certificate from the bidders asking the one question, are the specifications non-proprietary? The clients would get the answers from the vendors themselves. They would get the answers from the bidders. So that is a way. So there is a way in case the clients are interested to ensure that, that we have uh, these specifications which are non-proprietary and then only there would be true competition and you'd get the best prices. So that is as far as the tender package is concerned. Once the tender package is floated, then there is the pre-bid meeting in which all the uh, queries are answered and the responses are given. The sixth step is a technical compliance. So once you ensure that the specs, the makes are all non-proprietary and the bids are submitted, then do a technical compliance. After that is the vendor document. So once a vendor comes on board, uh, then are the vendor documents approved? I mean, the data sheets, the good for construction drawings, because there may be certain changes based on the ground condition. So the items are supplied based on the approved good for construction drawings. Then is the review of installation. I mean, the consultant needs to visit the sites on a regular basis, ensure that the best standards uh, which are laid down uh, don't just remain in theory, but are actually done. And uh, the last step is the site acceptance test. So once the systems are all uh, there, then the site acceptance test and let's say approval of the uh, as-built drawings, you know, the handover documents. So all that process is important. And in the last, you see my statement, shortcuts lead to shortfalls. Now, shortcuts are possible in any one of these steps. And you will find the end result. Uh, there may be a problem if you 
take a shortcut at any of these steps. So with this, Puneet, uh, I hand over back to you, having explained uh, well, what the process is. No, no, absolutely. Uh, and thank you for that, Kajla, sir. I think the start is perfect in terms of articulating all of this in, in, in a very, very sequential manner. And I remember in my times as well, when I used to do this day in and day out, we used to sit down and actually make uh, a basis here preliminary design three components as to something which we would classify as must-haves, good-to-haves, and the industry best standards to kind of really then classify and say, where does one really fit in? And that's uh, which kind of brings me to my next question. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw that open to Paul, sir. Uh, so when we kind of design all of this and we get to it, there is multiple ways that we are able to do this, right? And when we start doing this, uh, we realize that there has to be a, a process. There has to be something. Not everything is something that we can bring in from an outside and put through uh, in the system and put through into the asset that we want to secure, but we can use uh, the principles of what we in our industry commonly know as septed. And how would you kind of use that uh, to kind of further allude to how uh, the three C's per one indicated and then the steps, nine steps that Kajna sir kind of spoke about? So, uh, thank you, Panicha. Thank you for getting me on the panel and thanks to FSAI. So right now, the feeling that I have is of uh, Rahul Dravid. So we have had, uh, uh, what's your, Sachin Tendulkar and Sevag whacking the balls out of the uh, park. So now Rahul Dravid comes in. Now people say that, okay, chal jage, abhi chai pani lete hai. So, so bear with me. So obviously I'm not going to be as uh, fabulous as them. <laughs> so you know what, so, so let's me uh, come to the, the subject. So as a risk professional, so one of the things that you got to understand is what are we trying to protect? So the three basic things. So I like to go back to the basics. So one is you have to protect people, information, and property. So that is the uh, base on which this entire uh, stuff has to be built. So the minute we forget that, then uh, we, get, we get into a problem. <clears throat> so and another most important thing that we have to do is that as risk professional, we've got to ask those seminal question of who, what, why, where, when, and how. So on the basis of this is all the risk assessments which are based. So this on these things is the risk assessment platforms, uh, the techniques and the ways which I've been doing, which, uh, which Pawan sir and Deepak sir has, has said. It's all based on that. <clears throat> so coming to the thing of septed. Septed, the full form of it is crime prevention through environmental design. So. Uh, this concept was spoken of in the West in 1970s. So it has gone through some three iterations. The first, I mean, two iterations. The first iteration was in the 1970s. Then it came to in 2008, and now we are they are speaking of the third iteration. So a lot of uh, 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 iterations are happening. So SEPTED is also known as uh, design out crime, design in security, secure by design. It's a way of proactively uh, ensuring that the design of a building assists in protecting the three uh, in, uh, things, that the two P's. And <clears throat> so incorporating septed in our life uh, uh, in uh, buildings, properties, places, improves the quality of life. It assists in deterring opportunities for crime, reducing the fear of crime. Uh, so what happens is that when you are sure that at night, 11 o'clock, after you step out from office, you can be sure that you will not get mugged. So that improves the quality of your life. You don't have to, or else the security team has to provide uh, infrastructure to de-risk the location around a particular place. So that and all, it means uh, 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 it, it plays on the mind. And and until unless you are uh, John Rambo, everybody would like to work in a secure atmosphere. I don't want to go and get into fight each time I step out. So SEPTED is based on common sense. It's based on focusing on awareness. And SEPTED is a way or it's a multidisciplinary approach. Just like uh, what Pawan sir said and Deepak sir said is that it is not the vendor who will tell you how to design the building. It is you have to tell, Ki bhai, mujhe karna kya hai? 
पहले तो समझो कि वॉट इज इट दैट यू वॉन्ट टू वॉट वॉट इज इट दैट यू गोट टू कीप इन द बिल्डिंग इज इट गोइंग टू बी Uh, uh, is it going to be a currency chest of a bank? Is it going to be a hospital? Is it going to be a hotel? Is it going to be a, a data center? What is it that you want? Once you are clear of what you want to have, then you start designing. Uh, you can't have an all-rounder. Kapil Dev came and went. He is going to be he was a one once in a lifetime uh, uh, what should I say phenomenon. So it happened. So you can't have that. Buildings have to be. You got to know what has to be done over there. <clears throat> and in this. Uh, a very important thing is that you got to understand the site the location where it is like we have heard of sir speaking about green field brown field so it's very important to understand that set it can be set of a management tools for optimizing places behavior design and all working all working in tandem to uh, securing the two p's and one i's so uh, we can say that septed uh, promotes use of natural access control natural surveillance natural territorial reinforcement so what's all this so access control or natural surveillance so and what normally happens is that uh, when you look at uh, like pavan said that ki cctv laga lo so cctv ke andar se koi haath ja kar kisi ko pakda nahi so cctv in isolation is of no use so you know what for a theoretically you can take a ferrari engine and put it to a tractor but will the tractor give the same performance as a ferrari no it will not because it is not designed for that so uh, any equipment which is put has to be in sync with the entire systems and procedures uh, sops what persons have to do and a lot of times what people think is that ye securing a building is part of the security team boss that's the most wrong concept securing of a place is the is the joint uh, what should i say uh, responsibility of everybody philip kotler or somebody said that marketing is not the uh, uh, function of the marketing department but uh, of everybody so that is something that has to be done at all points of time we have got to so septed uh, also speaks very interestingly uh, it's just not of design it's just not of building bana diya ab chalo jo hona hone do it's not that it continues after that it's very important that you keep a building uh, ship shape at all points of time a uh, ill managed building sends out uh, uh, information that the building of the persons who are in the building who are managing the building is not careful or does not care about the safety security of the persons in the building and that is the starting of the end or the starting of a lot of issues for the persons in the building <clears throat> sometimes there are places that you uh, there are times when you can't totally de risk the locations uh, the way you are so then you got to think out so that also falls part of this uh, septed uh, concept so septed is not just restricted to design it is restricted to the it is it includes uh, the environment it talks to the police it talks to the fire it talks to the civic administration that's how this happens and it, it, it <clears throat> so uh, normally what happens is that septed uh, like uh, pavan said uh, vendor ke paas jaate hain uh, vendor ko bolte hain ki bhai design karo so i go a step back when has the security person or the risk person to be involved in the building or i mean in the design uh, after the four walls have been put up or after the masonry has been completed or is it in line with the architect see you know what when you build when you take an architect on board he has got a core competence of designing a building until and unless you provide him information and inputs on boss how the building should look not uh, interfering with the what should i say look and feel of the facade or something he will not be able to do it so it's important and i'm very happy to say that uh the professionals of today are getting involved in this entire activity they are uh, engaging with the uh, persons and ensuring that uh, what should i say people are determining the requirements what is the technology to be used and what is the architectural implementations uh, uh, implications sorry so 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 what i mean to say is that uh, septed is a all encompassing Uh, princi- uh, uh, principle and it's not something new. All of us have been doing it. It is just a few guiding principles uh, to ensure that persons are uh, uh, our assets are looked after. So interestingly, 
SEPTID is also very much used in the smart city concepts. In the smart city, SEPTID is something that is looked at. In India, obviously, we have been a little late at doing it. But if you look back to the tier two or the tier, I mean, the rural cities, uh, rural places, SEPTID exists. Like, for example, when I was, uh, when I was in my place, uh, hometown, uh, nobody knew me. So when I used to go anywhere, people used to ask me, who am I? So I had to give the name of my mother. My mother was a person who was known over there. So any unknown person is found out in the environment. <clears throat> that is an example of natural access control. That's a thing of understanding who's, uh, who's there in the particular place. So that is very important. In, in modern day cities, we, because of the fact that, uh, what should I say, modern day life and what have you, you don't know who's staying next to you. That is what is causing this problem. So SEPTED takes you back, takes you back to the understanding of inclusiveness, community feeling, community cohesion, all these things which are, uh, are a general thing. Like, for example, uh, going to the mandir, going to the church, or having, uh, uh, sitting together and talking, gossiping. So these are all information where you feel wanted and comfortable. So, so what I mean to say is that it is not a new concept. It is something that has to be done, has to be thought about, and we got to be uh, alive to the uh, what should I say uh, uh, to this particular issue, uh, uh, Punit. I hope I have not confused uh, everybody now. No, no, absolutely not. I think people who are there would kind of resonate well that this happens and. And we've seen that, right? And this accepted is something which is gets is is being talked about now. But I think if I have to kind of give my personal opinion, it goes back to DNA, right? What used to happen? There was no camera hundred years back, or when our kings and queens were there, right? They used to use primarily design, and more importantly, what we call as environmental design to protect them, right? Risk was there at that time as well. Okay. It, it wasn't there, but the way they used to handle it was different. That time there were no drones, there were no cameras, there were no, uh, you know, sophisticated weapons for them to play with, and they would primarily play with environment. So that's exactly, I think, which kind of builds in together to really say that how we can first use the environment that we have and then kind of get into the real role of uh, putting uh, this through. So I think absolutely aptly put across. I think it sums up quite well as well. Uh, thanks for that, sir. And so I'll now move on to what we really, really have to say, moving in from what the core concepts are to what uh, aspect should be to what environmental design can add value. Uh, I'll move on now to uh, Sambhaji, sir. Sir, with your experience, right, you've heard about TVRA and you've heard how we really kind of put all of these things into uh, aspects. If we move, change gears now and we move into what the current situation is for all of us, uh, you know, data centers did not exist earlier and it's, it's kind of come into systems now. From that perspective and more importantly, not specifically to a data center perspective, but from an industry perspective, how do you think uh, the steps or TVRA that has been put out, does it really benefit? If you are an end user and you're sitting on the other side of the fence, you've seen You've seen two consultants speak and you've seen one uh, consultant come end user speak. Now, from a purely end user perspective, how do you really uh, assimilate all of this and what would be your view out there? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, uh, Puneet, sir. And uh, thanks to Mr. Pawan, uh, Paul, sir, Deepak, sir, for you know, enlightening us with the security design process. The other, other aspects of, uh, of um, risk assessment to give a background and uh, to this is that uh, see uh, uh, so uh, just to introduce uh, myself you know uh, uh, and my company is you know we are into data centers like you know Yota was it's a part of Irangani group which is spread on a 600 acres of of a, of a campus which is located in the Panvel. It's called as Iranari Fortune City. And uh, my data center stands on a land parcel of 18 acres. So you can understand uh, the vastness of that area. And uh, white space is around 8 lakh uh, 20,000 square feet with 7,200 racks and 50 megawatts of power running into it. And um, 
and it was just inaugurated in the two months back uh, during the lockdown period only by our CM and uh, Maharashtra CM of Maharashtra and uh, by Heavy Industry Minister of State and uh, Central. So, uh, so just giving you the this was the background of our uh, Yoga Data Center. And uh, really, you know, after listening to Mr. Pawan, uh, uh, Paul Sir, Mr. Deepak, so what I have understood that uh, conducting a TBRA of a data center is of utmost, of utmost importance. So it has helped us, you know, in assessing the possible natural and man-made threat. It is highlighting the existing uh, preventive measures and considering the challenges specific to the uh, data center. And uh, that has helped us in suggesting a best industry practice. So what we have done is uh, for the existing existing property, we already have done a TBRA and that has really helped us a lot in identifying because this building, which is the tower, which is standing now, uh, it was really existing there. It was Hirandani property and then we, we converted into a data center. So that was a, that was a challenge where, uh, where, where we had to engage a consultant and our design consultant who really helped us a lot in in, in, in uh, security designing to making us a, uh, uh, giving us a security workflow, optimal utilization of security guards, security deployment, then the technology deployment. And that, that has really, you know, help us and in, to minimize the threat to the organization. So, uh, uh, again, the area which is this, this, this data center lies in the outskirts of Panvel, which is around 17, 18 kilometers away from the main city. So understanding of this, uh, 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 socio political communal religious uh, were the challenges you know we to understand how is the road connectivity what are the cr uh, uh, crime rate around the area and understanding the demography so all those uh, those things were uh, considered as a scope of tvra and it really help us to plan our strategies going forward uh, so and so i feel that uh, you know the, the engaging a consultant engage, engage the design consultant has really help us to uh, achieve that, achieve that, uh, uh, what you call the confidence uh, to the customers and our client, end client, end customers. So really, you know, uh, uh, the TVR has given us a greater uh, insights and uh, really if you, if you as experts, I would really invite you to see the site and then, you know, guide us further if there is any improvement required or any changes to be made. Yeah, thank, thanks, sir. That's that's good to know. So you you primarily will say that yes, since data center are the new age things, this has really helped you. And yeah, I completely resonate with the point that if it's far away from the city, what are the controls that you built in that in case of any eventuality, what's the best resource possible? Uh, I'll move on to another example in this case, uh, Paul. Sir, maybe my question will come to you uh, since you are part of the hospitality industry. We've seen a, a sea change in hospitality industry, right? After the Mumbai attacks, things have changed, right? Earlier, hospitality would never have such robust uh, procedures in place and so on and so forth. But right now, after the attacks, things really changed. Now we came into life changed, we evolved, and now we've come to another different set of hospitalities like the OYO rooms, which are budget, uh, uh, you know, areas that we have to. How would re you really kind of put a perspective here in terms of saying from a hospitality perspective, from an industry, hospitality industry, how do you really take these recommendations into uh, place and get them into implemented? <coughs> Thanks, Puneet. So before I start, uh, so during one of my uh, times that I wrote a mail to one of my stakeholders, and I got a very interesting phrase, which I keep it in mind all the time. <clears throat> he calls and tells me, Bhai, tum security wala hai ki tu lawyer hai. So, uh, so why I said that is that my view, these are my views <clears throat> on the security in the, uh, what should I say, proceed, I mean, uh, stands in the hospitality industry. So like you said, uh, the 2611 event in India was a watershed event in the hospitality industry <clears throat> and it acted like a wake up call to a lot of people to understand what was not done. <clears throat> and after that, a whole lot of, uh, what should I say, revamping was done, like you said. 
So in fact, at that point of time, I was in Mumbai, and to see any or the see to see the latest security equipments, I used to walk into a hotel and ask the security head to show me the stuff, and it was really mind-boggling. But you know, the next thing, the, what I want to say is going to be politically incorrect. But my what my question is, was that right? Are we shutting the door after the horse is gone? Uh, uh, could we not have done a uh, threat vulnerability assessment uh, before? Uh, why do we need to take a five power, five kilo hammer to break an egg? Don't you think a, a, a spoon is enough to break an egg? So that is something which is not done. So because of that, people will, you know, obviously we'll say Kasab came and this came and that came. But that is, see, how much could you have controlled it? And very unfortunately, putting your hand on our heart, being security professional, we know that we have erred. And so, you know what, let us not, I'm not going to run down India. Uh, US also has been the same. Until those two planes crashed into the, the Twin Towers, uh, they used to work, everybody used to work in the La La Land. And now after that, then the entire thing started changing. Unfortunately, that has been the case with India also. After 26 level, people started thinking about it. And now to the next part. Now we've got hotels with all sorts of stuff. We've got planters acting as unobtrusive bollards. We've got boom barriers. We've got police patrolling. We've got sniffer dogs, baggage scanners. Again, have we deployed resources as per the threat vulnerability assessment? I don't know. Or is it the question that ki, that uh, bar ho gaya and all, uh, uh, or I also understand there are certain things called optics. We do things for optics to ensure that persons will feel secure when they're coming into a hotel. So, you know, what? Uh, hotel or hospitality industry is a very funny place to be. Uh, because uh, you, uh, the who comes to the hotel? <clears throat> Hotels, people come for business, people come for relaxing, people come for eating food or basically letting their hair down. At that point of time, would you want the hotel or the hospital, that location to look like a fortress, a garrison in Kandahar? No, you would not want that. Nobody would come over there. You have dogs barking, you have people frisking you with a, with a weapon in the hand. No, it does not happen that way. So, so that has to be done. It's a very thin line. And this thin line is provided by acting on threat vulnerability assessment. And it is not a tick in the box. It is not a tick in the box. And we have to understand my time and again, enough in, uh, instances have happened in the world, which again shows that uh, having a right approach to safety and security assist in the bottom line of an organization. Uh, you go to any organization where things have, have uh, where there has been a fire, there has been an incident, there has been a drop in the patrons coming in, there has been a drop in the amount of money being earned, there has been a drop in the brand image. So, so why, so why are we waiting for that? So uh, we had this to so Sri Lanka after the LTT stuff. So they went and opened it up and they decided that uh, all is well in this world and it's a blue sky and uh, everything is fine. And then we had the Easter bombings. So a whole lot of people died. <clears throat> and now the government has changed. The government understands that they have to do something about it. Uh, security or being security aware. And again, this comes back to the assessment. And uh, so people ask me, so kitne bars, uh, Threat vulnerability assessment karna padta hai. Building banne se pehle, uh, karke khatam ho gaya. I said, no, it is not that way. It is an ongoing process. Maybe vendor to kya tha. Bala bhai yaar, vendor to kya tha. Vendor has done it. Vendor has, it is TVA, TVRA is like a taking a snapshot. At that point of time, the guy has given an assessment. Maybe he might forecast certain assessment. He can't look ahead in time and tell ki ye hone wala hai. So this has to be done on an ongoing basis. So that has to be done. So in my view, until unless we take these, uh, what should be the basic principles and understand the importance of it and emphasize and re-emphasize to the C-suite, we are going to get into trouble. I, I don't know if I, uh, maybe this is a dark uh, talk that I'm giving, but then this is what I feel. Uh, put it over to you. No, no, absolutely. Uh, I completely uh, get, your, get your views, which is good. 
uh, I know, and we can go on and on. But I would, I would now want to switch gears a little bit, um, looking at the time. And absolutely, there are a few questions that I see in the question and answer window as well. So I would want to go back to them uh, as well. So uh, without wait, you know, wasting too much on uh, the other side, sir. Uh, I would move out now to Deepak, sir. Deepak, sir, can you actually walk us? You know, because that probably may answer a couple of questions that are also put on the question and answer uh, box. Uh, and, you know, uh, then we can uh, come back to saying what is the new age technologies that are currently in, in place. Yeah, so Harsha, can you show the second slide? Okay, so, uh, so far, you know, we have uh, talked about uh, uh, security risk management, and we've all seen uh, the theory part of it, but we all wonder that uh, does it happen in the real world? I mean, can we follow all this? Uh, and do we have a case study? So I thought, you know, I present a case study of an asset management company. Now, this is an MNC with uh, seven commercial facilities in India. They were taken over from multiple owners and there was a wide variance in security technology in the operational towers. This is because the towers, uh, there were multiple towers. I mean, these facilities are what you see in the snap below, you know, multiple towers. Now these towers were built in different times. Now, since there wasn't a risk assessment in place or a common security, uh, concept in place, a different kind of uh, security technology system came up in all of these towers. So you had wide variance within each site and within, uh, I mean, in, in the seven sites, uh, greater variance. Now, there was project towers coming up in six uh, of these facilities. So what was done was that the uh, risk assessment of two facilities was conducted first to get a feel of uh, what, what uh, are the risks, what, what is the context that we're talking about? I mean, what is the level of security that we desire? Based on that, a security technology standard was created to list the operational requirements. Now the standard was approved by the management. Now see, the management buying is very important. So, you know, the, because it has implications, because see, security, at the end of the day, day is a spend and there are certain risks uh, not all risks can be mitigated so the management needs to know as to which are the risks that we are mitigating and which are the risks that we are accepting so once that buying is there then that technology standard is an approved document so that security technology standard was a common document it was then available to all the seven sites and the asset upgrade of the operational towers and security the design of the new project towers was undertaken based on the standard. Now, you know, it's an interesting question to ask and the standard, I mean, even the new standards that uh, let's say FSAI is let's say trying to introduce and check. So each organization uh, must have the standard, but I wonder uh, how many organizations exist uh, with, with, with these standards. Uh, now, once these standards were in place, the enterprise now you know, has a single open video management system across all campuses, which would integrate the varied system mix. So now an open system has been put in place and, and the multiple makes of CCTV can all be integrated within, uh, within this system. And also a common view of all the facilities is, is now going to be available. Now the cameras are being deployed to cover the same relevant areas across all sites. So now with the standard in place, there is no you know, time wasted in trying to sort of in each site work out which are the areas to be covered. It's all there. Now, all the sites have a common parking management and a visitor management system and a centralized control room is being created in each facility. Now the design of the upcoming facilities would also be done basis the standard 
ensuring assurance of achievement of a common security level across all facilities. And uh, the last point I want to convey is that a process has been set in place of a regular risk assessment. Uh, like it was just covered by the previous speakers, I mean, security is not static. This, like Paul said, you know, once you've done it, you, you already, once a standard has been created, the standard is not a static document. So a process has been put in place for regular in-house and external consultant to review the threats and revise the security standard if required. So uh, I hand you back, Punit. I, I hope the uh, case study conveyed what, what we've been trying to explain through uh, the theory that we've covered so far. No, I, I think absolutely, and it does emphasize the point of view that yes, we need to have uh, proper sequencing uh, plans put in place to ensure that uh, it's just not static, but it keeps rotating over a period of time. Absolutely uh, clear. I think that that also leads us to our uh, our next uh, area. That with with today's DNA, right? Things are very very different. Uh, what we did ten years back is irrelevant now, and I presume what we do today will be irrelevant in three to four years from now. So. Uh, uh, somebody so just coming back to you if I have to kind of uh, rephrase this and say from the industry specifically the uh, data center industry that you are associated with how are you readying yourself for such technological changes that you and and in the view that you are going to be protecting your clients uh, interests and information because because that's exactly where the next uh, area of uh, uh, threat is right uh, today threat has gone from physical threats to more from a digital threat, threat a threat right so how are you kind of taking care of the future and what what is what is your recommendation from a futuristic standpoint yeah agreed with uh, you mr punit uh, so as a preparedness or or a norm uh, for the future technology what we are ensuring that uh, our the main aim is to ensure that our client is protected all the times. That is what our aim is. So what we have benefited from our earlier TVRA and engaging a consultant uh, before we start our work. So um, this is uh, you know, the various recommendations which were given by our our consultants, our designing consultant, our uh, TVRA consultant, based on those uh, to ensure that uh, there is no pilferage or no theft happening. So we have gone to the deep root level, you know, to the rack level, uh, to the cage level of a customer. So installation of, uh, you know, the key management system, which is, which is a, where there is no human intervention required in those keys. So that is a very critical, um, uh, what do you say, that uh, servers are very critical to the customer. That level, we have ensured that the keys, handling of keys, the, uh, the locker management system are all automated. So that we have introduced uh, the technology over there. Uh, where uh, the human intervention is not there. So logs are maintained for audit purpose. It is very easy to do a, a carry out the audit of this of these equipments on a regular basis. Again, uh, for the for the for the uh, technology perspective, like uh, a data center which was uh, in a panvel, which is at a panvel. So um, uh, for the material management, so there is there was a risk which was or uh, highlighted or consultant that the material which is coming inside a data center is not been scanned. So that was a that was a past experience also in other data centers where I worked for. So what uh, the the mitigation plan was given is that we have uh, have a handle explosive detection system now, which is a very handy one, which uh, it is the latest one and it is uh, costing around 35 lakhs to us. But again, the viability of that machine was checked, the feasibility was done, and then we have ensured that um, uh, the material which is coming to data centers are fully scanned to that detection system. So what has done because of this, uh, it has given a lot of confidence to our customers uh, who are you know engaging with us uh, uh, in the near future. So that has given a lot of confidence to them, saying that uh, you know the thorough checks are being carried out before the material is being carried in the data center. So uh, and and that that um, uh, similarly our our CCTV surveillance system. Earlier the CCTV cameras were just for a monitoring purpose. Now, uh, when when this uh, because of this analytics and uh, uh, which are being incorporated in our softwares, 
so that has also given a lot of confidence you know monitoring the 1400 camera in such a large premise was a challenge for our operators also but due to this ai and uh, intelligence cam intelligent cameras uh, so that that challenge has the, the that um, uh, effort has been you know, reduced of our operators so the efficiency of the operators have been increased so that is one thing we have learned from uh, uh, these things and uh, again all our uh, assets which are moving in the data centers are been uh, you know scanned through rfid system all the assets are been tagged so all these things whatever uh, uh, measures we have taken or precautions we have taken has really give us gave, gave our customers a lot of confidence in uh, doing a business with us so that is how we are getting ready for our future clients no no very very aptly said uh, so that's that's good to know that you are taking all the precautions now i'll i'll kind of ask this probably a last question in the interest of time because we have some uh, q and a to follow uh, to uh, to pavan pavan as as shambhaji sir said right and and with the newer technologies that are in the advent there would i am presuming assuming that there would be newer risks unknown risks uh, how would you recommend as a from a consultant standpoint to corporates or to technology organizations that what should be their tech security standards or what should be their protocols that you are not compromised in the current dna what would one do pavan uh, you are on mute Yes, yes. Uh, thanks. I think great points made by Samji, uh, uh, Samaji on this part. Uh, I would like to uh, take a, a slightly different view on this. I think we are in evolutionary mode. We are trying to incrementally change and incrementally improve. Uh, so, uh, but I think the stage has come for a much revolutionary mode. Uh, uh, the reason I say that is that uh, every consult the from a tvra to operationalization of any scz or data center or any big uh, project takes at least 3 to 5 years horizon it can be done in 2 years but at least 3 to 5 years horizon and when we are doing design today or in next 6 months the implementation of that is going to happen after 3 years and people will expect that technology will run up for next 5 years so what we are designing today or in next 6 months it will work for next 8 to 10 years that is the expectation and in that context i think we are very uh, i sorry to use the word incapable or incompetence from each user as well as uh, consultant side of you because things are going to drastically change once the iot comes uh, sorry uh, or not iot the 5g comes in and it gets operationalized it is going to be very very different how many of peop, uh, people and when we are putting designs in place are even putting 5g as a backbone and they are talking about iot vr drones how how many designs i have not seen many designs which talks about futuristic technology they are not futuristic because what you design today is going to be operationalized in 3 years it is going to be the normal aspect in in the next 3 to 5 years timelines so very very important that most of the designs which were happening today has to be future futuristic and scalable in future most of what we are doing is today what is the best available so we are talking what is the best for today and designing it designing it for next 10 years that is not going to work because most of the design are going to be irrelevant in next 3 to 5 years uh, down the line so very very important there is a huge amount of awareness and education is required at this point of time that this will work, work for next 2 to 3 years but if we want to really make use of technology or leverage technology we have to change the way we design the entire thing the it backbone the whole way we think about security has to drastically change because uh, we may not have guards it may be the the vr it may have the complete uh, what you said the security control room might be driven by uh, the vr technology we might be sitting at homes the security teams might be sitting at home and and, and actually uh, monitoring cameras instead of coming uh, and having a command center command center concept might be irrelevant in in 3 to 5 years uh, time so designing a command center today which will be irrelevant in 3 years is is a wasteful uh, expenditure so are we putting those experiments or at least blueprints uh, in 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 uh, uh, in uh, in context today i think i feel it's a, it's a time for revolutionary jump 
and jump a generation rather than doing an incremental jump. I think that's my view on this. No, I completely, I resonate that very well because that's what I've seen in my, in my span here. All the technology companies who have heavily invested into technology, not considering technology to be a cost when it was construed to be a cost. Right, and we see that battle happening between a technology spend vis-a-vis -vis a, a physical security spend. Right, you always see that the that the incremental thought process of the CX uh, or rather the C-suite level is on technology. So organizations who had robustly built into technology in the past have seen that in this current times when this pandemic broke broke off and the crisis really broke on uh, on everybody, they are the ones who have easily survived through. And and moved ahead uh, in the curve with with whatever uh, you know resources that were there with them, and so that is that itself gives us a sea change or a, sh a shift of things to really articulate and understand how a technology vis-a-vis -vis a control mechanism uh, mesh can really help the future that we are uh, kind of uh, looking at, right? And it's going to be a disruptive future, right? At that time, the wars are going to be uh, different at all so yeah i think it's been interesting i have i see a lot of questions here i'm just going to double check with the organizing team should i read the questions from here or would you be opening up the uh, opening up the channels for a few questions to take because i think we are we have less than five minutes from the schedule but if it's okay we can probably take a few questions uh, that are there uh, urvashi uh, should i read up or you're opening up the lines Yes, sir. You can read out those questions and you can answer it online. Sure, perfect. Okay, so I am. Uh, I see a lot of questions here. Uh, Ten of them are answered. Okay, perfect. So I'll leave it to the uh, to the open ones there. Uh, uh, so one is one question is by squadron leader uh, Vinay Krishnan. He's asking Pavan uh, about the TBR and he's trying. Can you please elaborate how we can find proof of incident in Tata version if something goes wrong in a work, workspace? Example, harassment or workplace violence. Uh, okay, uh, thanks for the question. I think when I say Tata version, it is just a concept to show that we trust our people unless and unless and until proven. So I think uh, uh, Major Paul has even uh, elaborated on that. I think it's not only about the cameras, who, who are the proof uh, of uh, which is there. There are a lot of other ways and means like the septet is an excellent example of how do we, how do we design? How, how are you putting excess control mechanism in place? How, how is the culture? Is the culture really, uh, how kind of, what kind of awareness are we putting? So it's a very, uh, I'll not say there is a straight answer to that, but there are a lot of aspects. The culture will be a great aspect of it. Uh, and what is said is uh, in an environment like, uh, I'll say uh, just uh, for want of a better word, a Tata kind of a culture, it is not, the, they are not looking for the proof actually. They are looking for if this kind of, a, if there is an apprehension, if there is a kind of an, uh, uh, fault which is coming on somebody uh, and if there is enough uh, circumstantial evidence uh, there are ways and means uh, uh, to communicate to a person uh, which is there so it is not always you need a hundred percent proof that I saw on a CCTV camera that you 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 harassed, uh, harassed I think I saw a question on harassed the women or uh, just uh, there are different ways uh, uh, so culture plays a very very important role the environmental concepts as accepted plays a very very important role Camera is only one of the aspects uh, which can which can uh, define the whole thing. There are there is a larger angle to the, the entire concept to the whole thing. Uh, I hope I'm able to answer that uh, query on that. Sure. Yep. Thanks for that, Pavan. Uh, I see the second question, uh, which also specifically asks that in the tendering process, how do you deal when vendors who just put in yes to every specification in the RFP as outlined? What is the process? Uh, you suggest to validate those yes and its genuinity. So I leave it to Pawan or to uh, Deepak sir or anybody who would like to take this question. Deepak sir, go ahead. I think I will yeah, yeah, Pawan, you said you'd like to answer, so you can start. Yeah, sorry, I see Pawan, we'd like to answer it live, so you can go ahead. Uh, did I say that? Okay, okay I'll, I'll do that. So, sorry, I just missed the last point of it on, on the question. 
So it's saying in a tendering process, how do you deal with vendors who just put an yes to every specification that the RFP has outlined? There is a concept of what is the process you suggest to validate those yes and its genuinity? Okay, uh, so there is a concept called, I think Puneet is a better uh, to answer on this thing. There is a concept. No, I'll answer, I'll vendor answer. Due, I'll yes, answer. vendor due diligence which has to happen. So it is not about taking on prima facie on, on, on this thing that yes. There are certain non, see, if you ask 100 questions, there are five or six or 10 non negotiables for you, which is really, really important. In bigger RFPs uh, and bigger this thing, you even do vendor uh, vendor site, you do a lot of things. Uh, so you don't go by uh, what vendor has said, yes or no. You actually demand proof for certain 10 or 12 non negotiables which are there, and then go ahead with whether it is yes or no. Yes, a given leave, left anybody. People will say yes on that, but there are ways and means uh, to to cross check. I think I'll leave to Deepak uh, sir and Puneet uh, to elaborate on how uh, uh, more uh, uh, this thing can be done on that. Deepak, sir, you want to take a shot yeah. before I yeah. Yeah. You see what happens is that uh, compliance to specifications is one part, but also the data sheets are requested. So once you get the data sheets, the consultant needs to go through the data sheet to personally recheck whether all the items that have been, let's say, required are there in the data sheet. That's, that's a way that you can reach it. Yeah, and, and apart from the data sheets, what, what a lot of things happen uh, in today's world is what we call as vendor diligence. So uh, you would read the RFPs that come out, there would be a small disclaimer and a small line which will say that the management reserves the right to do a cross verification about you and your organization which then gets in uh, people like us and the others who would actually do a vendor diligence without you knowing that there's something happening in there, right? It will be kind of a quick public domain search, which will understand from different domains where you've this, da, done this kind of work, where did your name appear, whether there were any concerns, uh, and multiple other things that you may have said a yes to but your employees would differ and there are so many forums and there are so many blogs and there are so many data points that are available today. You'll be surprised where actually if you go, you will, you yourself will, you know, feel that why are the employees saying all of this, what they've said, right? So that way, if I have to say, uh, there is enough ways to validate and you could do a detailed or a, uh, a quick vendor diligence to kind of reconfirm that. And the second way is to kind of also have the articulation done through referencing. Uh, you ask for four to five references, national and international, which will help you to really go back and corroborate uh, uh, the findings that you would want to have. have. Right. So that's that's the way that currently uh, it's happening. Uh, okay, I have. Another few questions. Uh, do we have five or more minutes to take two more questions, or or how are we going, Roman? You can take, sir. You can take one, one more, one or two more, whatever. You can. Uh, okay. So there is a question on the last hand side. But is it, okay. I'll take his question. I'm going bottom up in the list that I see. Uh, so Paul, sir, this one is for you. Uh, please provide insights on demonstrating ROI on systems investment. So I just had a uh, disagreement with uh, Ratnagar, so that's why he's putting me on a hard spot. So that's why. <laughs> <I didn't. laughs> so uh, so okay. Uh, so Puneet, I may I may want you to step in uh, because I'm not uh, I don't have a full bandwidth to answer this right now. <clears throat> so Ratnagar, what I see is that you're asking system investment. So uh, I presume that it is on security system investment. So if that be the case, so it's a question of. Uh, uh, what is the uh, uh, what should I say? What is the way you're looking at? Uh, what's the culture of the organization? How would you want to uh, what should I say? Uh, protect your assets. Uh, how would you want to uh, uh, what should I say? Uh, ensure that they are given a reasonable, uh, safe, and secure workplace environment. So, so these are something that has to be answered with respect to the amount of care, the duty of care that can be given. These are some points which come to me very briefly. So obviously it's not uh, adequate enough. So Puneet, uh, may I please rescue, I mean, uh, phone a friend. Uh, can you please help me? 
No, so uh, Ratnakar sir, there is no right or wrong answer, and uh, as as I said, you know, uh, uh, earlier as well. Uh, how do you really derive the ROI? So, if if you've seen technology companies who've really invested a lot, three years back there was no ROI that they could have proved on piece of paper to say, well, this will happen. But with what happened in COVID right now, you know, you will say, well well invested in technology and somebody can now take a pat on the back to say what I thought three years back has really uh, given us uh, yielded results, right? So that I think that's where I kind of, uh, again, this is a personal view. I kind of disagree from the fact of view that should we really think about it as a cost? The very fact that we start thinking about security as a cost and that's where Pawan alluded to when he started off gives us the question to say, does this capex or does this cost help us in anything? Because we still are living under the philosophy to say that this has not happened to us, right? But when it does happen, do we have the bandwidth to recover from it is the question that we need to ask. So we have to prepare for the worst and hope that the worst never happens. But should it happen, we are well controlled to say, well invested, right? It's, it's, it's purely like, uh, if I may say, uh, in, in, in layman terms, taking a term plan, a lot of people don't believe in taking a term plan. They say it's a waste of money, right? I am going to live 80 years, but what if you don't? So it's, it's, all, about, it's all about how your perception of risk is and how would you take that so that's that's my view Pavan, you want to add anything no, i think it's just you said it's uh, taking a term plan is the excellent example and or, or uh, in indian context why this question comes is because everybody wants to take a life insurance policy for saving tax which is not the right reason so asking for a roi <laughs> becomes uh, sometimes a difficult uh, uh, aspect on on that yep uh, that would be my thing uh Okay, I have another question and please, please, uh, we can see the questions on the screen. So if I'm missing on anything, please, please do send it up again. We have another question from Vijendra Singh. He says, how can a security function become profit center from cost center? Today, all CEOs and CFO talk about it, profit and tangible benefits. A good one, I think. Pavan, <laughs> Deepak, uh, uh, Shamaji, sir, you, anybody would like to take it. Good one. Uh, uh, like if, you, if you just uh, said, you know, why, why is everyone interested in making this uh, center? It's, I don't think it's a correct uh, comparison to, let's say, production or, you know. So, sir, so I agree to that. I, I agree to that. But I, I'm also taking a stand from the other side. It is a fact, right? It is considered as a cost. So I, 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 we, I've been part of the industry and I can, I can assure you and I can vouch for it that it is being considered as a cost center. If I was uh, from a technology domain, I was an IT head, I would go and I would say I have a CapEx, five minutes, I would get the approval, I'm out. But if I'm a security head and I go for a CapEx and I say I need to install all of this, I have to fight a battle for it to get approved. Now, that is the reality I think that a lot of corporates are facing and I wouldn't shy away from it. So the idea primarily is how do we kind of have that thought process built in? And I think that's that's the reason why we chose this topic as well, right? When we were debating on the topic as to what do we really do? I think it's all about the mindset that we have and it's all about kind of bringing that value to the table. I think now, rather than earlier, of, I would say seven, eight years back, I think when Pawan and myself were there together, say 2009, 10, it would have been a difficult task. It was a difficult task, but now things have changed. I think now there is equal weightage being provided uh, to that aspect. So I think it's it's just just like going back and putting the right facts in on the paper is what I I personally feel helps is articulating what we are trying to uh, trying to uh, trying to safeguard for the future is 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 helpful again that's personal point of view but anybody else would like to add please um, so I'll, I'll give i'll give the approach that i follow you know so once i've done this i lay down as to what are the measures and what is the cost estimate if you implement all those measures 
Now, if you don't implement X, this is the risk that would remain. If you go even below, if you don't put it at Y, this is the risk that will still remain. So ultimately, then you know it's a management decision of what they are willing to spend, and accordingly, what is the risk that would there. So you know it is a consultant's job to be able to quantify and present it in a manner that the management understands the risk of let's say not doing that expenditure to the optimum level as the consultant has. Done. Oh, absolutely, I agree. Quantifying the risk is absolutely something that uh, resonates well with me. Right? Absolutely. Uh, I think we have we've overshot by ten minutes on the time. Uh, I would I would you know I'm happy to kind of be happy to kind of get into another mode another session uh, uh, at a later point of time. But at this point, I think we need to kind of get it to a close. So firstly, thank you very much uh, all of the panelists for coming in. Absolutely great insights uh, from Pawan, Deepak sir, Paul sir, uh, somebody you should write from the three C's. Right from doing the TVRA to really understanding the two P's and the one I that we are we are all talking about. Lucepted, I think uh, a lot of practical examples were uh, kind of shared. Thank you so very much. We can kind of allude to a lot of them and we can keep on going on and on. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the time and effort. Back to you, uh, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Puneet. <clears throat> it was really a very informative as well as very thoughtful session. Thank you, all the panelists. Uh, before I thank, I should uh, ask Pankaj sir if he would like to add something on it because it is the topic of his interest, some standards and other things he would like to say about Suraksha Index further. Uh, Mr. Darkar. No, I think uh, it was a great learning this afternoon, uh, starting from Pawan in terms of three Cs. Uh, Deepak ji giving nine steps and uh, our Rahul Ravid, Mr. Paul, I think uh, everybody covered so well, uh, including Sambhaji's giving insight of the beautiful facility which nation, one of the largest data center which you have built. Uh, I've been uh, interacting with Niranjan ji through my Ashojam Jam channel every week and uh, it is very fascinating to know that a, a routine developer has thought of putting such a huge uh, infrastructure in Jaga Center. I think this is going to open up a new era uh, because they also see uh, a business uh, potential there and uh, rightly so, right time, uh, probably as Puneet rightly said that we all are tuned to uh, computers and mobile so much that uh, this data center business is going to grow multiple fold in our country. And uh, I think uh, thanks to our security team, Tiwari ji and uh, Puni ji for taking up this subject. And my request once again to entire team is uh, this assessment process should be part and parcel of our FSI index. I think this will create a huge awareness uh, in the country. Currently, this is limited to some of the hospitality chains um, data centers and I would say 10, not even going beyond 5% of what environment is getting constructed. It has a huge potential. Uh, it will ensure that uh, our next generation, maybe we start now, but I'm sure uh, within five to 10 years, the business uh, opportunities for the professionals and uh, new consultants would grow enormously if this awareness is taken. So. I, thanks to FSA and security team specifically for touching this important subject. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Zarkar, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, think, I think it has already been taken very well. And uh, what Mr. Deepak has said that to understand how risky is the risk is, it is better to quantify the risk to understand how much cost is involved if you compromise. So thank you very much, all the panelists. Thank you, especially to the FSAI team for conducting this, like Mr. Suresh uh, and uh, Suresh Markom and uh, uh, Harsha, Renu Madam, and all the team, Urveshi, including Urveshi, who has supported a lot to conduct this kind of uh, weekend seminars and webinars. So I should thank all the participants who are available all the time. We had a good list of participants this time. And I request all of you, if you are not a member of FSAI, please be a member of FSAI. Please interact. 
please be a part of our team so we can have a good coordination as we are doing every week we are doing one or two seminars or webinars so please be a part of it keep on attending the same thank you very much sir thank you thank you thank you sir thank, thank you. you romin for nicely coordinating thank you sir thank you